you to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. And we're going to look at the entire chapter, all 22 verses. Uh, most of y'all know I don't usually preach 22 whole verses either. Uh, that, could, that could lead to some hours, but uh, I, I, I'm going to try to get through this the way I'm supposed to. And uh, there's, there's, there's some really good stuff in there. There's some really good stuff. And when I started studying this, I, I, I thought I was, you know, pretty familiar with the story. But as you read and reread the Bible, you find that there are things in there that you missed the first time or the second time or the tenth time that you read it. So uh, uh, everybody turn to Exodus chapter 3. If I had to title this sermon, I would title it, I Am. I Am Your Deliverer. I Am Your Deliverer. Uh, recently, my wife and I took the opportunity to go see a movie together on our date night. We went to go see uh, Exodus, Gods and Kings. Anybody seen that yet? No? Uh, you know, when I was looking at the commercials, I was thinking to myself, oh, they got another biblical movie out. Maybe they got this one right. <laughs> um, unlike that, that Noah movie they released a few months back. Oh my goodness, that was terrible. Um, and so I was really hopeful because, um, what's his name, Scott, uh, Scott Ridley, he's the director, and he, he directed one of my favorite movies, Gladiator. Oh, yeah. All right, you ever seen Gladiator? Yeah. He, since he directed Gladiator and, and the movie looked really good and it was intense, you know, I said, oh, this is going to be good, this is going to be good. And you know what, if, if I had never read the Bible, <laughs> if I had never been to Sunday school, <laughs> If I had never even seen that old movie, The Ten Commandments, you know, the one with um, Heston in it, I probably would have been okay with the movie. But since I saw that, and I've been in church all this time, I think the movie was appalling. It was terrible. It was terrible. They did some things in that movie that you just shouldn't do with the Word of God. Um, some things in particular that disturbed me about the movie is that they focused more on Moses' actions than they did on the real, the real hero of the story. You know who the real hero of all the biblical stories are, right? It's God. But, but they, were, they were kind of making it out as if Moses was kind of, you know, had this thing all under control and he was trying to do it and he was pulling his hair out because he couldn't do it and he th knew he couldn't do it right and it just, it just really was a, left a bad taste in my mouth. Um, another thing that they downplayed in the movie was the goodness and the sovereignty of God. They, they missed the fact that God is in control of everything. And if you read Exodus chapter 3, you find that, that God, God was working the whole time, even before Moses ever got there. And then another thing that, that really, really ticked me off. I mean, if I, if I cussed, this would be the thing I cuss about. <laughs> Y'all know Christians don't cuss, right? Okay. So, so, so if I, but, but, but if so, I would have cussed about this because they represented God, the Almighty God, as a little nomad-looking shepherd boy almost. He was like a little bald-headed dude, a little bald-headed guy, maybe, maybe ten or twelve years old, if that. And this is how they represented God. And every time, every now and then, God would appear to Moses, and they would have a, a argument. That's how they picture it. And so, so I, think it's, I think it's high time that we, we get back to the scriptures. We, we get back to seeing what God has actually had written uh, down for us for our learning and for our instruction so that we can find encouragement and, and also so that we can get the story straight. Because the, the stories in the Bible are true stories. I, I come to find out that um, after when I read an article in Christianity Today, that says that when Ridley was asked about the um, historicity of the movie, he says he wasn't really trying to base this off of the past. And I, I tell you, he succeeded <laughs> admirably in not, in not basing this off the real history that we find in Exodus chapter 3. So, so turn to Exodus chapter 3, and I want to read it, uh, at least the first part real quick. Let me just read the first verse before I give you a little background on, on this chapter and where we are in the Bible. 
Uh, the Bible says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So, so, so uh, if, if you want to look at where we are in the time of history, this is after the death of Joseph. Uh, his brothers and all, uh, he and all his brothers had died by now. Um, and a new king arose up that didn't know Joseph. Okay, that's how the, the book of Exodus starts off in chapter 1. And, and the people of God, the Israelites, the children of Israel, are growing so rapidly. They, they, they're growing so rapidly that the new Pharaoh says, you know what? We need to subjugate these people. We need to put them under tax. We need to put them into slavery because they're getting so big that if we don't do something, a war might break out and they're going to go inside with our enemies and fight against us. So that's why they put the children of Israel in slavery. All right. So, 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 what he decided to do to curb the the tide of the multiplication of the Israelites because they were multiplying like crazy. You know what? He got this great idea in his head. He said, "I'm going to kill all of the newborn male children as soon as they're born." He told the Hebrew he, he, the Hebrew mothers, uh, "Y'all got to get rid of them kids." Yeah. Y'all got to get rid of those kids. You got to throw them in the Nile. And the Hebrew midwives, as they tried to deliver the children, they went back and told Pharaoh, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. The Bible says they feared God. They feared what God would do to them more than what they feared Pharaoh would do to them. Yes. Amen. Okay? Amen. And, and so they told Pharaoh a lot. They said, by the time we get to the women, they've already delivered the child. They're not like you Egyptian women. They're, they're strong and virile. You know, you know Egypt is an Africa. Y'all do know that, right? I, I'm just saying. It is Black History Month. So, 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 so they're strong and virile. And, and, and they, they deliver before I even get to them. They don't even need all that help. <laughs> so by the time I get there, I can't just take this newborn baby out of that mother's hand and throw him in the, in the river or kill him. So, 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 so Pharaoh tells his people, y'all stop throwing him in the river. Tells his own people, start throwing them in the river. All right? And um, this is a circumstance that Moses was born under. One, one Levite family, one, one, one family of the house of Levi, a guy by the name of Amram and his wife, Jacobed, they had a son, and, and the Bible says that she hid him for three months. She knew that if he was discovered, he'd be killed. He'd be thrown into the Nile River. So she hid him in a basket. She made a little ark. Sort of like Noah's Ark, but the miniature version. Okay? And she, she, she put her son into that ark and put him on the Nile River and let him float down a little bit. And, and it so happens that Pharaoh's daughter saw the ark and commanded that it be brought to her. And she opens it up and she sees his little baby. And she says, oh, that's one of the Hebrew babies. And so she calls somebody, uh, um, I'm sorry, his, his, his sister, uh, Miriam, the child's sister, Miriam, comes and says, you want me to go get somebody to nurse the little baby for you, because he's a newborn, almost, okay? He's still nursing age. And, 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 and Pharaoh's daughter says, sure. And she, guess who, guess who Miriam takes the baby to? Yes. Takes the baby to his mama, to Yaka baby, all right? And, and, and her, his mama gets to raise her own son and wean him for like six months or so or more, okay? And when it was time to stop weaning, she took him back to to Pharaoh's daughter, and he lived with her as her as her son. Okay, so 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 this little baby boy, she looks at him and she says, "I gotta call him something. I gotta call him something." She calls him Moshe. All right, in Hebrew it's Moshe. All right, and she calls him Moses. We come to know him as Moses, and this Moses is the one who we find in chapter three of Exodus who is now almost 80 years old. He had killed a person back in Egypt, had to run away from Egypt as a murderer because Pharaoh said, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. When, I found, when he found out, I'm going to get you, Moses. And Moses fled into the wilderness and ends up marrying a daughter of Jephro. Amen. He, he, he starts tending Jephro's flocks. He becomes a shepherd. And then one day, 
That's what we pick up in chapter 3, verse 1. One day, he's taking the flock around, and the flock is following him, and he's, he's guiding them to pasture. And all of a sudden, he sees something he can't explain. He sees a bush that appears to be on fire, but the bush is not actually being burned up. The, the bush is on fire. He sees the fire. The flame is going, but, but it doesn't look like it's destroying the tree. It's not destroying the bush at all. Amen. And so he turns aside and he sees. Look, look at verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. That's what he saw. And so Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned? When the Lord, watch this, notice now that another person's name is injected here. First, we're talking about the angel of the Lord from verse 2. And then it says, um, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him another name uh, out of the bush, Moses. Moses. And he said in the usual you know, Hebrew way, when you answer somebody that's calling your name, and you say, and we usually say, yes, he says, here I am. Some of your older translations say, here am I. Okay? So, 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 he encounters something he can't explain, and the narrator says that the person who's speaking with him at first is the angel of the Lord. Uh -huh. Y'all remember the angel of the Lord, right? Anybody remember the angel of the Lord? The angel of the Lord is the same one who spoke to Hagar, Abraham's other son, okay, by the Egyptian, spoke to, spoke to his mother Hagar while they were in the wilderness and told him, look, you're going you're gonna to have a son. First, first the angel of the Lord told her she was going to have a son and to call him Ishmael. And then later, uh, the angel of the Lord called to them and said, look, um, they were in the wilderness. They were about to die from thirst, all right? There was no water in the wilderness, in the desert. And, they were, and, and she had put the child over in the bush so he could die. And the angel of the Lord said, it's going to be okay. Look up, look up. And provided some water for them so that they wouldn't die in the desert. Okay, same angel of the Lord. You also remember the angel of the Lord from uh, Genesis, I believe it was chapter 22, where, where God speaks to Abram, uh, Abraham, when he's on that mountain, he's about to sacrifice his son. Remember that? And he's about to sacrifice his son, and he got the knife, he's got the dagger in his hand, he's about to stick it in him. And then the angel of the Lord speaks to him out of heaven and said, Stop, stop. Don't, don't touch the child. Okay? And that's where we get that ram in the bush from. All right? God had provided a ram in the thicket so that he could sacrifice the ram instead of his son because he was testing Abraham's faith. So, so this is the same angel of the Lord. And then in the following verses, this angel of the Lord is called God. Uh -huh. The angel of the Lord is God. See, see what, what we see when we see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, we see a physical, we see some kind of physical manifestation, some kind of picture of God right before us. That's what they saw. They saw something. It wasn't always, he didn't always look the same. Because in this instance, he appears out of a flame of fire. But then he starts speaking to Moses. He says, Moses, Moses. He calls his name. And, and see, in Hebrew, in, in Hebrew culture, when you call somebody's name twice like that, that means that you must know them pretty well. Mm -hmm. That means that you're, you're, you're being addressed by a loving person. In English, you know how we do, we say, I, I might say, Freddie, Freddie. Well, I would just say Freddie, and then I wouldn't say it twice. <laughs> see, if, if I call him by his first name, that means we're on a first name. That means I really love you, and, 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 and we got a, a real close relationship. I care for your well-being. That, that's what it means in Hebrew when they call him by two names, by both the name twice. Okay? And because, of course, he's our pastor, respectfully, I say, Pastor David. I don't call him Freddie. <laughs> because I want to respect my elders, you know. Okay. But I have real estate is supposed to stand up. I was supposed to stand up before the gray-haired man. <laughs> addressed by God, by the angel of the Lord, who himself is God. And, and it says God called to him, he called his name, he says, here I am, and then we see something about God that, that, that 
we as New Testament Christians, I think we really need to pay close attention to, real close attention to. Look, look at what God told him in, in verse uh, 5. He says, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Y'all see that? Yes. I, I think in our modern age, this word holy escapes us sometimes. <laughs> I, I really think it does. Uh, uh, you, you notice that people, people don't fear God like they used to. They, they don't see the separateness of God. That, that's what holy means. It means set apart. It means I'm not like you. Amen. That's, that's what God is showing Moses. I, I'm, I'm not like you, Moses, so, so you got to back up off me. You, 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 you got to be careful how you approach God. You can only approach God the way God says to, to approach him. You see, us in the New Testament, we, we got it so good. We got it so sweet. By grace through faith, we can, we can always approach God. We, the Bible says we, we go into the very throne of God. We can boldly go before the throne of grace and, and just ask stuff. God, can I get this? God, can you help me with that? We, we got such liberty in Christ. Oh, but, but what Moses is being shown, he's being shown the holiness of God. Well, what makes the mountain so holy? Why, why I gotta take his shoes off? I mean, what makes it so the only thing that made that mountain holy was the fact that God was there. Well, well, well don't we say that God is here? Christ said when two or three are in the midst, are yeah. gathered together, I'll be there in the midst, right? Yeah. And so and so I wonder, do we get that sense when we come to church? When, when, when the saints get together, even if we're not in this building, he says when two or three gather, he didn't say in a church building. Because you know, you are the church, right? Amen. We are the church. The church is within you. You make up the building blocks of the church. And so anytime we get together, Christ is there. But, but, but I, just, I just wonder if, if God's holiness is lost on us sometimes because because some of the th things we see in churches are, are just not they don't they just don't look like we we revere God like we used to you know uh, uh, some people some people these days they walk while scripture is being read we, we didn't used to do that when, when people are praying sometimes people try to come into the door that's why we got ushers to try to block it but 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 even then sometimes they get through when, when people are praying to Almighty God yes yes but, but God yeah. is holy. Yeah. Yeah. God is sanctified. Yeah. Yeah. God is not like us. Yeah. Yeah. He, God says, I'm not a man that I should lie to you. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever I say, it goes. Yeah. The old people used to say whatever God says, it, that settles it. Uh -huh. yeah. God is sovereign. Yeah. Yeah. And he's holy. Yeah. And that's how we approach God. Yeah. Yeah. Look, look, look at what God says, though, in verse 6. Uh, Moses right now doesn't know who he's talking to. He don't know who he's talking to. He just knows that he sees something, sees someone, he hears the voice, the voice telling him to back up, all right, don't come any closer, and take those shoes off. But he doesn't really know who he's talking to yet. Amen. And then in verse 6, God identifies, he begins to reveal himself to Moses. Look at what he, does, what he says. I am the God of your father, yeah. your father Amram, yeah. all right, and the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses, check this out, he hid his face. For he was afraid to look at God. He had a healthy fear. When, when he realized who he was talking to, or who was talking to him, immediately he said, hold up, hold up. He got bashful real quick. He got afraid. He wouldn't even look at God. Maybe, maybe he, he instinctively understood what God told him later, that you cannot see me and live. Man can't see me and live. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe that came to his mind all of a sudden. Maybe the vision of, 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 of the theophany he was seeing, this, this angel of the Lord in this flame, maybe it intensified as he was sitting there listening to God speak. And, and he just got more and more afraid. Well, whatever caused him to hide like that, Moses said, I'm not looking up again. I'm not looking at him. He hid his face from God. But then... Look at what God does. He begins to calm his fear. God says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. Y'all see that? 
and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. I don't know about you, but, but I, I, I got some sufferings. The people of Israel had some serious sufferings. I'm, I'm surely not comparing mine to theirs. These people had been enslaved for over 400 years. All right? It's Black History Month, right? Does that sound like anybody you know? Uh, we were enslaved for uh, hundreds of years as well. All right? But God delivered us. Okay? The, the fact that we can, we, we, we live in a country where a black man is president shows us that God is up to something. God can deliver anybody. God can set anybody up as king or as president that he wants to. God is sovereign. God says, I am the God of your father. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is identifying himself so that Moses would have no question of, of who it is who's speaking to him now. I'm sure Moses had heard the stories. Moses had heard the stories about Abraham and how God delivered him and how God gave him a son in his old age. Yeah. And I'm sure he had heard about Isaac and about Jacob and how God had, had kept uh, Israel uh, um, nourished up in Egypt before they got into slavery. Yeah. I'm sure he had heard the stories. But now he's old. He's like 80 years old. And now God is speaking to him, saying, I'm the God that you've heard all the stories about. I'm the one that you've been, that, that Jethro has been being a priest for. I'm the one. And then he says, I know their sufferings. You, you got some pain in your life today? Be sure, just like this verse says for the children of Israel, God knows your sufferings. Amen. God didn't have to take away your sufferings immediately. He didn't do that for, for, for the children of Israel. They were, they were in, in misery. They were, they were being beaten. They, they, they were being misused. They were being oppressed for over 400 years. Yet God didn't take it away until God was ready. That, 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 that's one of the points that you need to realize. You need to realize that, that your life is in his hands. I, I, know, I know people like to tell you God has a plan for your life. He does, but, 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 but don't lose this picture that God has a plan. Y'all didn't get it. Y'all didn't get it. Okay, 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 okay. God has a plan for your life, but God has a plan that supersedes every plan of every individual. Amen. God is doing something before you were ever born. Amen. Before Moses was, was drawn out of that water, God was already doing something. Amen. And it's up to us to look into his word and find out what is God doing. Amen. What is God up to? Amen. And how do I become a part of what God is doing? Amen. 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 Moses was about to become a part of what God was doing. Yes. Yes. Whether he liked it or not. Yes. Look, look at what the Bible says. Um, verse 8. God says, And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. Look at what God says he's done. Look, look at the great condescension of God. God, who, who the old folks used to say, uh, sits high and looks low. God says, I've come down. Can you imagine? Just, just think about it for a second. He's talking to Almighty God. I mean, the one who's ordering the universe day by day. The one who spoke, and it was, and it held fast. He's talking to the God of all creation. And the God of all creation said, you know what, you know what I'm doing? I've come down. Uh -huh. yes. I've come down. Yes. I've come down, first of all, to speak to you. Uh, yeah. I've come down. And he's speaking to lowly old Moses. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. And, and, and he tells Moses his plan. Uh -huh. no, notice Moses is not telling God what he wants. God is telling Moses what he wants. God says, I've come down to deliver my people out of the affliction that they're in. And I'm going to bring them up and I'm going to move them out of Egypt into a land that's flowing with milk and honey. A, a good land. They won't have to want for anything. They'll have all need and it will be provided by me. God, God says that's what I'm about to do. And I'm, I'm letting you in on it right now Moses. 
Look at what he says in the next verse. Now behold, verse 9, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Yes. Just before we go past this verse, don't miss that, that part. Don't, don't miss what God is saying to, to Moses about his people. He says, I've heard their cries, and I've seen what their oppressors are doing to them. Likewise, God sees everything you're going through. Amen. God, God knows that, that, that you're having problems. Uh -huh. God knows that there's some marital issues between some of you. Uh -huh. God knows that there's some job issues with some of us. Yes, God knows that there's some children and, and family issues between children and their fathers and their mothers yes. among us. God knows all that. Yes. God, God knows that on your job they oppress you, uh, yes. some of us. Yes. God, God knows that, that, that sometimes uh, uh, people treat you in a way that they shouldn't treat you. Yes. God knows all that. Yes. God hears it when you cry to him. Yes. God has heard every prayer you've ever prayed. Amen. Everyone. Amen. And, and he hasn't forgotten not one word of any of them. Yes. God, God, God is sovereign, but God is also omniscient. Yes. And he's omnipresent. That just means that he's everywhere yes. at the same time. Omnipresent. And he's omniscient. He knows everything there is to know. Yes. Both actual and potential. Yes. In other words, he knows what's actual happening now, and he knows what might happen later. Yes. And he has the power to control the outcome of every single life in this building. Yes. Every one of them. Yes. And he has no, look, it's, it's, nothing's too hard for God. Yes. He can do it, and, and he don't even break a sweat. Yes. That's the God that Moses is speaking to. And God says to him in, in verse 10, come, come now. I will send you to Pharaoh yes. that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Yes. God says, I got a job for you. I got a job for you, Moses. I already told you, Moses, I've come down. I'm the one doing the work. I'm the one who's going to free them. I just want you to come and go as I send you to lead them back to me. Yeah. You see, Moses had already wandered that wilderness before. Yeah. Moses knew his way around by now. I mean, he had been there for a long time. So he was, he was well acquainted with the wilderness by now. And he could go back and he could lead the children back to God's mountain. And God says, you know what? I'm going to send you. And he, did the typical, he, he gave the typical response that a lot of us give, especially us preachers, we give when, when God calls us to do something. <laughs> He's like, Moses is thinking, hold on now. <laughs> you know, Moses was with God the whole time until now, until he told him to do something. <laughs> right? That's how a lot of Christians are. Uh, we fine as long as we're sitting there and we don't have to do nothing. But as soon as we're asked to do some work, yeah, sometimes we get a little scared. Yeah. But, but to man, Moses, Mo, Mo, Moses said to God, Mo, Moses thinking, hold up, me? Yeah. Hold up, you just said that you want me to go to Pharaoh, that dude who rules the Egyptian empire, who's got chariots and horsemen and a great army. You want me? I mean, I'm 80 years old, and you want me to go back to Pharaoh, the place that, that they said they were going to kill me anyway, and you want me to bring your people out of Egypt. He asked God a, 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 a direct question, who am I? Who am I to go and get your people out of Egypt? Come on, man. It's almost comical when you think about it. Because I, I think, I, I, but I think a lot of us have the same response. See, yeah. God asks us to do something yeah. sometimes, and we think we're responsible for doing it all. Yeah. Come on, man. God says, like, like he says to our brother Crowder recently, yeah. uh, Brother Crowder wants you to preach. Yeah. And, and some of us, when we get the call to preach, we say, you don't really want me, do you? <laughs> I mean, I can't even talk. That's what Moses said a little later. I, I can barely speak. I, I don't know if y'all ever noticed this, but I stutter all the time. <laughs> and, 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 and Moses had, he, he, he said, he said I, can't really, I can't really speak. Uh, that's one of the complaints he gave. 
Uh, but he says, who am I? I don't have any status. I don't have any rank. I, I used to be a little something when, when I was with Pharaoh's you know, uh, daughter when I was living in her house. But now, I'm a, convict, uh, you know, I'm a convicted murderer. And you want me to go back there? Uh -huh. Wait for me. <laughs> <laughs> who am I? Who am I to go back and, get, and bring your children out of Egypt? Um, and, and I like what, how God responds. Look at how God responds, and, 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 and I just, this is the main part of what I want you to see, how God responds to Moses and, and how that encourages us today. It's just amazing um, how God responded to Moses. Look, look, at, look at verse 12. God said to him, but I will be with you. Yes. Let me read that again. Yes. I will be with you. Yes. Yes, sir. Let me say it one more time. I will be with you, God says. Yes. It doesn't matter what God tells you to do. It doesn't matter how hard you think it is. It doesn't matter how long you think it's going to take. It doesn't matter uh, 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 what obstacles lie in your way. God said, I've come down to do a thing. And so God will do what he intends to do. He is the deliverer. You, Moses is not the deliverer. I know a lot of books say that. And, and, and the movies say that and, and all that. But Moses was not the deliverer. God was the deliverer. Amen. God raised up. If Moses, look, if God hadn't saved Moses when he was a little baby, Moses wouldn't have been there. That's right. Amen. So, so before Moses became the so-called deliverer, Moses got delivered. Amen. At birth. Amen. All right? And, and, and I want you to keep your focus on God. You, you will worry much less if you keep your focus on God. Yes. You will cry much less yes, if yes. you keep your focus on God. Yes. I'm asking God for some things right now. I'm asking God to get me out of debt. Yes. How about that? Yes. Anybody ever ask God? I, I'm not, yes. you know, I, I didn't ask God to pay this off. No, I asked God to get me out of debt completely. Yes. Amen. And I'm still waiting. Yes. Okay? I'm still waiting. Yes, sir. Amen. But, but, but God heard me. Yes. I believe you heard me. And he, he, God is just so strange sometimes. I don't know if y'all ever noticed this yet, but God, God can be really strange when he answers. Check, check this out. Let me, let me just give you a quick example. Last week, I'm driving my car uh, to a job, okay, to a job site, uh, seven, about, about, about six something in the morning. I'm driving. The, my, my truck... I, I'm, I'm probably going a little faster now. I ain't gonna tell you how fast I'm going, but, but I, I, I was doing at least the speed limit on 95. <laughs> okay. And uh, and um, all of a sudden, my vehicle stopped in the middle of traffic. It, it began to whoo, shift down and back up. Now I had the cruise control on, I think. And, and so, even with the cruise control on, it began to shift down, so I slowed down almost, I mean, not to a dead stop, but I slowed down to maybe about 40, 40 miles per hour, when everybody else behind me, of course, is going, you know, 50, 60, 70. And, and, then, and then, to get it back to go up, I had to press on it, but it was over revving. It was like, I had to, to get back to the speed I was at, I had to rev it all the way up. So, so obviously, the transmission was dying, was, was slipping, okay? And, but I made it to work. Thank God. Amen. No accident. Yes. Okay? And, and of course, you know how we do. Man, my church, this is about to die. And, you know, I made it to a store when I, when yeah. I got, finally got to the site. I went to the gas station. Yeah. And, and another thing that scared me a little bit, I tried, I, I pulled into the parking space, and then I backed up, and the, and the vehicle wouldn't back up. And that definitely told me something was wrong with the transmission. Um, so I cut the vehicle off, and I cut it back on, and, and, and lo and behold, it let me back up. I'm back in business for a second. <laughs> so I went to I went to work, went around the corner, went to the job site, and 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 then after that, you know, it was time to go home Friday evening. And I'm driving home, and it does it again. Oh, I'm on 95. And I'm trying to go to speed. I'm doing about. I'm being a little more careful this time. I'm doing about 60. And it does it again. <laughs> right? And I'm like, oh God, don't tell me I got. This. You know, I gotta spend a bunch of money for uh, for car repairs. I don't even have any money. I mean, I've been I've been out of work for for like over a year now, and and, and I don't I don't have the money to be paying this. 
So so Monday, I get to the car dealership. Yes. Sir. You know they're waiting for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, they're gonna greet you with a smile. They know they're about to get in your pocket. So so I, I, I tell the guy, check it out for me, the engine lights on. Um, and he checks it out and he comes back to me with the report. <sighs> the report was seven thousand dollars. On a, on a 2007 vehicle. Yeah, right, okay. So, 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 and I even got another opinion from a place that specialized in transmission, and they told me that just to fix the transmission, not the other part that was wrong, because the radiator is busted too, uh, that that's going to cost at least 5000 before you get to the radiator part. Okay? So, so I'm thinking to myself, um, Lord, uh, need a little help, need a little help. <laughs> Need a little help, Lord. Need, need a lot of help, Lord. Need a lot of help. First of all, I don't have seven thousand dollars. All right. And and and, and second, third of all, if I can't drive, I can't do any work. I can't make any money, just like you, right? Yeah. And I can't buy food, and I can't do this, and I can't do that, just like everybody else. So, Lord, I need some help. So I cried to the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let me just pause here. If, if, if you want to do some crying. Yeah. <laughs> Right. But who are you crying to? Are you crying to your neighbor who can't help you? Are you crying to your brother-in-law or your brother your sister who really can't fix your problem? I mean, if, if you're going to cry anyway, you, you may as well cry to somebody who can actually help you. So I cried. I cried like the children of Israel. I cried. Today, yes, sir. you'll find that I'm driving a new 2015 Nissan. Make sure that your clapping is not about just God giving you something. Make sure that you understand that He is my hero. Small capital letters, 
and it's on the same height with the rest of the letters, but that shows you that there's something special about the name. Yeah. Yeah. That, that name, the Lord, in the Hebrew is Yahweh. Yeah. Yahweh is the actual personal name of God. I mean, we, we're familiar with a few of his names, Elohim, El Elyon, and, and stuff like that, but, but those aren't his personal name. Those names can be applied to other gods, but this name, Hallelujah. There's nobody named this. Amen. This is the tetragrammaton. Yes. That just means it's a four-letter word. And it's the divine name. This, this name is above every name. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. I know some of y'all are thinking of Philippians right now, but I'm coming in. You, 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 this name is higher than every name ever mentioned in the Bible. Yes. And every name ever mentioned on earth. Yes. This name is higher. Look. This name is the name that God told Moses, look, when you go talk to my people, you give them my proper name. I want them to call me by my real name. Yes. I, I'm going to, look, I'm going to be, the, the name simply means I am the God who will be there. Yes. That's why I told you that story. It doesn't matter what your situation is. God says, I am the Lord. Yes. I'm your deliverer. Yes. I am the Lord who is there. That's right. I'm there. When your car stopped working. Yeah. I'm there when your marriage stopped working. Yeah. I'm there when your relationships are fractured. Yeah. I'm there when you've been depressed and afflicted at work. Yeah. God says, I'm there. Yeah. Amen. That's what the name means. Yeah. I'm the God yeah. who'll be right there. Yeah. Yeah. God promised I will be there for those people. Yeah. Those are my people, Moses. Yeah. You just go tell them what I said. Yeah. And let me handle the rest. Yeah. Amen. I'll take care of the rest of that plan. Yeah. I ain't asked you to do nothing, Moses, but go. Go. And yeah. come back. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Come back. Open up your mouth. Yeah. And I'll speak for you. Amen. I'll teach you what you ought to Amen. say. Amen. Oh, I know you, you didn't get a lot of education, so what? God can take uneducated people yeah. like us and raise them up to levels they had never thought possible. God is able to do that. So don't you dare let that be an obstacle to, for you doing what God has called you to do. God can do anything. God is sovereign. God, God is awesome. God, God is hallowed. That, that's, what, that's what Jesus said in that prayer. Hallowed be thy name. And that name is Yahweh. Well, we're living in a New Testament era. Thank you, Jesus. And we don't usually call God Yahweh. So we think. But but there is a man named Jesus yes. that God sent. Yes. But this man ends up being the he's actually the son of God. Yes. He's yes. God in the flesh. Yes. I know Israel had God walking with them in the fire as a pillar of cloud uh, uh, by day and as fire by night. I know they, they would eventually see his glory on the temple and the tabernacle. But you know what? God did an amazing thing in our time. Yes. Yes. 2,000 years ago, we had a man to be born named Jesus. Yes. And you know what Jesus is? You know what Jesus means? Jesus means Yahweh saves. It means Yahweh is salvation. So when you call the name of Jesus, what you're doing is, is good. Look how, look how awesome the Father thinks about his own son. He conferred his own name into Jesus' name. And so now when the people of God come together and we worship the Lord Christ, who is almighty God himself, we're calling the divine name Jesus. Paul picks it up in Philippians and he says, there is no other name above this name. There is no other name that we can be saved under. There is no other name higher than this name. For this man is highly exalted after he took a, a seat on that cross and he died and he hung there. He died, he died, he died, he died, he died so he could save us from our sins and then he took the chariot up. He ascended back up to where he was and now he sits there. The man himself sits there. He sits he sits, he sits there in heaven and he's listening to every prayer you give. He's listening and he's watching. You remember Matthew 28, uh, 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 
right, right at the last verse, verse 20, he says, Lo, I'm with you always. Even to the end of the world. God is with you. You know Christ? You're in Christ? God has done no less for you than he did for his people. He has come and he has dwelt in each and every one of our hearts by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen.